Welcome everyone. Um, this is Passive House Accelerator's Next Gen program, where we discuss the future of Passive House and look to the next generation of practitioners who are shaping the future of building. Um, and so with that, I'm excited to pass it off to Carmel to uh, introduce our first speaker. Yes, um, we're really excited to have Heather McKinstry with us today. She's an associate with Datner Architects in New York City. And as a leader in Datner's Sustainable Practice Group, Heather chairs the Committee on Building Energy Usage. Heather believes that architecture's most important role is to create inclusive, healthy, and sustainable buildings for our communities while minimizing their impact on the natural environment. She's currently focused on affordable housing, and we'll hear about one of her latest projects, um, 425 Grand Concourse, which is the largest via certified passive house building in North America currently. Uh, located in the Bronx, this building is mixed-use residential and provides 277 passive house apartments for low-income New Yorkers, as well as a grocery store, a healthcare and dental clinic, a public bathroom for the adjacent park, and space for CUNY's Hostess Campus. 425 Grand Concourse won the Nystrata Buildings of Excellence Award and the 2022 FIAS Best Overall Project Award. Uh, so we're really excited to have this project highlighted by Heather. Um, Heather comes um, from a background in architecture and uh, fine arts, um, studied at Rhode Island School of Design. And she's a lead AP and a certified Passive House consultant. Heather, so excited to hear about this project and hear about your journey um, through Passive House. Take it away. Great, thank you so much for that introduction. Carmel and Zoe asked me to share a little bit of my kind of uh, personal path towards working on Passive House projects. So I'm going to start with a little bit of my background. Um, as was mentioned, I went to Rhode Island School of Design. After I graduated, I started working at uh, Kish Cathcart Architects in Brooklyn, and um, I worked on the uh, on Bushwick Inlet Park, which is the uh, Brooklyn headquarters for the New York City Parks Department. Um, that project won the New York City Public Design Commission Award and AIA National and AIA New York Code Awards and is a certified uh, LEED Platinum building. The rooftop PVs generate more than half the energy used for the building, and it's completely covered by an occupiable green roof, which is irrigated entirely with, with rainwater uh, collected on site and stored in an underground tank. Um, so that was just like a really great <laughs> kind of start to my career working on sustainable buildings um, and, and kind of pushing the envelope of, of what was possible. Um, while at Kitchen Cathcart, I also worked on Solar 2, which was the design for the current Solar 1 site on the East River to expand the existing environmental learning center with a net zero energy and net zero water building. Um, it was a, a really compelling project. It won the Wholesome Gold Award, but unfortunately was never built. Um, but it really was, again, pushing that envelope of what can we do here in New York City. On both of those projects, as well as a series of rooftop greenhouses for public schools in New York City, I worked with uh, Claire Mifflin. Uh, Claire has been an amazing mentor to me and many others. She was generous with her time and knowledge and taught me everything from thermal bridge-free detailing to living machine design to understanding how we could create productive um, architecture. Uh, Claire went on to write the zero waste design guidelines for New York City and started her own company called Think Woven. She's worked as a consultant on a few diner projects, so it's nice that we've kind of come full circle again and, and get to work together. Uh, in particular, she worked on one of our passive house projects, uh, Chestnut Commons, uh, helping streamline tenant waste and recycling management. Uh, I eventually found my way to the affordable housing sector where sustainability is not only our responsibility, but healthy building design is an imperative as architects for people with very little housing choice. Uh, I worked in San Francisco for about two years. And when I returned to New York, I was looking specifically for a firm that specialized in affordable housing, where I could work on projects with high performance goals that are critical for achieving our low carbon future. I found that opportunity at Dagner Architects working on 425 Grand Concourse, one of the largest passive house buildings in North America. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about the benefits and challenges of applying the passive house standard to large mixed use multifamily buildings. 
At Datner, we had four multifamily pass box buildings that we were working on kind of simultaneously, uh, and they were each completed within about the last 18 months, and they represent a total of 961 passive house apartments. Uh, all four of these projects are either FIAS certified or awaiting certification from FIAS. Uh, but we do have a couple of uh, passive house projects on the boards right now uh, that are pursuing PHI certification. Uh, for each of these projects, our predicted EUI is in the low 20s, and Sensei Gardens, Chestnut Commons, and Vital Brookdale are all offsetting some of that energy use with rooftop PV panels. Um, we use this slide to show that Passive House uh, doesn't limit what kind of structural system, back of wall, facade treatment we use, uh, nor does it dictate kind of what the building is going to look like. Uh, I, as I said, was the manager, the project manager for 425 Grand Concourse, so we're going to focus in on that project. Uh, we had a really excellent team. Uh, Dagger was our MEP engineer. Gase was our structural structural engineer. Uh, Weintraub Diaz was the landscape architect. Goldstick was the lighting designer, and Stephen Winter Associates was the sustainability consultant. Uh, the developers are Trinity Financial and MBD Housing, and Mananak uh, was the contractor. And as was mentioned, the project won a building of uh, buildings of excellence award from the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, NYSERDA, uh, which provided funding and uh, they're collecting data on actual energy use and um, and humidity levels at a more detailed level than what is uh, required by our local New York City local law 84. I'm assuming the audience here is pretty savvy about passive house. Uh, but I just wanted to show this slide. You know, we often see the the basic principles of passive house diagrams onto a single family home. Uh, so we created this graphic to talk about how those principles uh, are put to work on a, a multifamily scale. All right, so I'm going to talk about kind of the the benefits of working on a large scale with passive house, but also the challenges of working with really small individual spaces. Uh, so one of the biggest benefits for us with a large building uh, meeting Pascal standard is that we are minimizing the surface area to volume ratio. Uh, with a tower like 425 Grand Concourse, we're also minimizing the roof area to volume, and that's the surface with the greatest potential heat loss. Um, at least three of the main pillars of passive house design are about the facade uh, with high performance windows, continuous insulation, and continuous air barrier. So really maximizing your volume and minimizing your, um, your facade is really, uh, really critical and helpful in achieving the passive house standard. Uh, you can see here, our insulation requirement ended up being not that far from code minimum. We were filing under 2016 New York City Energy Code. So, uh, you know, roof insulation was R30 anyway. Um, yes, our above grade walls were higher, but that um, that energy code standard is increasing and getting closer and closer to the past file standard, which we love to see. Um, but we, we didn't have to go that much above and beyond for 425 Grand Concourse. Um, in contrast, uh, one of the other projects that I showed at the beginning, Vital Brookdale, has uh, building sections that are six and seven stories tall, and we needed a much higher uh, R value for roof insulation, and we had to look a lot more closely at the uh, window performance in order to, to meet the passive health standards for that building. Uh, this red dashed line on our kind of section perspective is our air barrier. And you can see it again here in plan. Um, one of the challenges with the mixed use building was determining where we, uh, what will be inside and what will be outside of our passive house envelope. It was decided that it would be uh, too challenging to put the retail space within our passive house envelope since that space is being fit out by a tenant and we couldn't plan for what their MEP needs would be. Um, but the retail space is within our air barrier. So it is, you know, really still a high performance building, uh, part of our high performance building. Uh, because of the height of our building uh, and the residential use, we are required to have a gas generator. And we also have a fuel oil generator for the educational use on the second floor. 
Those generators need huge louver areas to the um, exterior for venting. Uh, so it just wasn't feasible to have those within our passive house envelope. Um, so what we did is we created this detail that you can see on the left here, where we use um, a you know double wide CMU, and uh, we have our Henry Airblock STP liquid applied air barrier and four inches of rock wool rigid mineral wool insulation, um, essentially creating an exterior wall condition uh, to separate out that generator uh, mezzanine space. Um, we also have a comfort station, as was mentioned, essentially bathrooms for the adjacent public park. Um, and again, they, uh, they require a, a lot of ventilation. So we use that same strategy to kind of carve those out of our passive house. The City University of New York Hostos campus has an entry, I'm not sure if you can see that, but uh, it has an entry on the uh, bottom right here in purple, and it's the entire second floor of the building. And there's also a community facility and a health and dental clinic on the first floor, and those are all within our passive house envelope. So again, getting back to kind of the scale of passive house on a, a, a high rise building, uh, the average new home size in the United States is 2,300 square feet, uh, while the average apartment size, new apartment size in New York City is 870 square feet. Our building is 100% affordable and funded through New York City HPD, which means we follow the pretty strict HPD guidelines for room and apartment sizes. And what we ended up with was an average unit size of 670 square feet. And that's with a mix of one, two, and th uh, studios, one, two, and three bedroom apartments. So that's just a, a really high density of people per square foot, much higher than, you, than you'd see in other places in the country, certainly than in most single family homes. Um, and that really increases our cooling load and our uh, relative humidity level. So this is our typical tower floor plan. Um, and one of the issues that we had uh, is uh, that the equipment on the market when we were in design was really meant for larger spaces with larger MEP loads, you know, not, not always built to the pass it off standards. So they're oversized for our room and apartment sizes. Uh, we tried to overcome this where we could by using floor mounted VRFs that condition two spaces within the same apartment. So this one down here, that's a floor mounted unit that's serving this living room and this bedroom. Um, so that was, uh, you know, we, we tried to deploy that where we could, but it wasn't a universally applicable solution. Obviously this second bedroom in that apartment can't share with another room. Um, and it also took away some floor area, which obviously anywhere is a, <laughs> is a challenge, but in New York City, you know, we obviously have very high value floor area. Um, so these are those floor-mounted VRFs being installed. Um, passive house requires all return air to be ducted. So even though these units are made to use the wall as a plenum, uh, we ended up needing to put small return ducts uh, on the bottom of the units uh, to meet that passive house requirement. For these units, we ended up with an access panel on uh, in one of the rooms, that's usually in the bedroom. And then in the living room, it's pretty nice. You just end up um, with the vents. Uh, in other spaces, we just use uh, wall-mounted cassettes, which you can see here in these three kind of interior views. Um, these are just very standard units, but it means that they're oversized for our spaces. So they're going to cycle on and off more than we like, and they're going to be a little less efficient um, you know, than if they were in a, in a larger space. But this is what was available, so you know, that's what we, we had to use. And we're, you know, hopefully the market is catching up with the, the sizing for um, MEP equipment for the minimal needs of passive house spaces. Uh, one of the other issues we ran into was the number of VRFs per compressor. Um, because our VRFs are working well below capacity, we could run more of them than the typical number that's usually associated with uh, any individual compressor. Um, and we're still, you know, well within the compressor capacity. Um, so in order to make that work, Mitsubishi had to write custom programming to allow for a greater number of VRF units to be served simultaneously by one compressor. So 
So it took some time and effort on Mitsubishi's part, um, but it's something that now they can roll out to other passive house buildings. So as more of these buildings get built, more of these solutions are going to be available. Uh, and one of the benefits that we're able to reap um, by having so many apartments uh, served uh, in, in one building is that um, there's a branch controller on each floor. So if there's an apartment on the south side that's getting a lot of sun, you know, midday or in the afternoon, and maybe there's an apartment on the north side where it's a three bedroom, but only one person is home and it's a little bit cool, um, they can... Uh, the person on the south side of the building can be cooling, the person on the north side can be heating, um, but the refrigerant can pull the heat from the south side unit and bring it to the north side, um, bypassing the compressor entirely. So really um, limiting our energy use there, just exchanging heat entirely within the building. Uh, so we did look at a unitized ERV approach, um, but we would again lose floor area in every apartment. And really the big, uh, issue here is that it created an access issue for maintenance. Um, you know, those filters need to be replaced. Uh, there's 277 apartments. So having to access those within any single apartment was kind of a, would be in, in, an issue. Uh, so we ended up with a centralized DRV system. Um, we don't lose as much floor plate, although we did have to plan for, for uh, a little bit larger of risers um, because those ducts are serving 12 floors. Um, but this is our, you know, in yellow and orange, you can see our kitchen and bathroom exhaust and uh, in blue, our supply to the living room and bedrooms. Uh, so we have four large uh, Swagon ERVs serving the residential tower, two sit on the podium roof and serve the low zone, and two sit on the tower roof and serve the high zone. Uh, we also have a couple of smaller ERVs for the non-residential uses uh, that are uh, on the podium as well. Uh, so these are just a, a few more construction photos. The first is the air seal being blown into the ducts to prevent air leakage. Uh, the second photo is the third party air leakage test being performed. And then finally, these are two of our very large uh, ERVs on that third floor uh, roof. So one of the design considerations that we had to look closely at was uh, whether to use ERVs or HRVs. And we did end up with ERVs, um, basically to, to minimize our cooling loads and keep humidity down uh, in the summer. Uh, so humidity in the winter was also a concern uh, because the ERVs are so efficient at retaining latent heat that they're not exhausting much of the moisture produced in the building. Um, so in winter, we could potentially have a, a condition where we have relatively high uh, where we have high relative humidity indoors and low temperatures outdoors. And what we want to avoid is creating condensation at or within the facade. So the engineers at Dagger uh, did an analysis of the humidity in the building. And since our ERVs serve around 70 apartments each, um, what they found through that analysis is that the high relative humidity conditions in some apartments in the winter would be mitigated by the other apartments. All that air is mixing together in the ERV. And when the fresh air is brought in, they're, you know, uh, the high humidity apartments are going to get lower humidity air. We do have humidity sensors throughout the system. So if the total humidity level for all 70 apartments being served by any one ERV gets too high, uh, they can slow down the enthalpy wheel and more latent heat will be expelled um, from the building. It does mean that we lose some sensible heat as well, lose a little bit of energy, we'll have to, you know, use a little more heat. Um, so that mitigation technique is really limited to when there's a danger of condensation, but based on the analysis, that should be a pretty infrequent scenario. They estimated that um, that might start uh, being the case around something like five degrees Fahrenheit. So if you think how many hours a year, is it five degrees or lower in New York? It's like, I don't know, 12 hours a year. It's, it's a really short period of time that they might um, need to be slowing that enthalpy wheel. Um, all right, so the humidity level, oh, oh, right, okay, so, you know, all this was done with analysis, the building uh, was completed this, uh, the summer of 2022, when people started moving in, so we're now going to start getting that data um, from the humidity sensors and the energy use, and, and we'll be able to see um, kind of 
what conditions are really popping up um, as people start living in the building um, and, and whether those, you know, whether the speed concern really comes, becomes a reality. Due to our efficient form factor and the density of our building, um, we are cooling load dominated. Um, and beyond just being cooling to load dominated, we are much closer to the passive house limit on cooling load than we are on to the, to the limitation on heating load. So we had to be really careful about um, our building uh, our, our building cooling load. So uh, we use um, solar shading. Uh, that's you know an integral part of our structure. Um, we have large sunshades mounted on the south of the facade with shift blocks to keep our insulation continuous and minimize thermal breaks. Um, in these construction photos, in the first photo, you can see those shift blocks above the window flashing. Then the next photo, uh, that uh, Henry Air Block All Weather STP is uh, you know liquid applied all around. Um, so that's our air barrier, and then we flash around it with the Henry Blue skin. Uh, you can see uh, just below the, the connection for the sunshade is the uh, expansion joint um, above the, the header of the window. So we're also using that blue skin to expand that expansion joint. Um, and then we have, uh, you know, on the first photo on the bottom left, that's when our um, our metal panel facade uh, rails go in with a, a thermal break at each connection to the building, our rock wool, you know, rigid mineral wool insulation, uh, and then the metal panels go on. And what you're what you finally see there is just the um, the steel angle coming out from between the panel joints, and then the sun shades get bolted on. So everything else in the building, like with most buildings, is built from the bottom up. Um, but the sun shades actually had to be installed in conjunction in conjunction with the scaffolding coming down. Um, so the the sun shades at the top of the building were installed first, and then as they brought the scaffolding down, they installed the sun shades um, as they were going. Um, so finally, you know, revealing the full facade as they went. And we have a little time lapse video. So the concrete the structure being put together, being poured in place. Um, and then they start coming in with the CMU backup wall. Uh, they're flashing the windows from the inside as they go up, and then the scaffolding is coming up. They're doing the uh, liquid applied air barrier as they're going up, and then coming in with the uh, rails for the metal panel, the insulation, um, and finally um, putting those metal panels on. We have these kind of inset sections on the south, so they came in a little bit behind the rest of the floor, um, but then they, they make it all the way to the top. And then the scaffolding starts coming down as those sunshades are being installed. Eventually, all the scaffolding comes down. We get the we get to see our whole building together, um, and then just finishing up on the podium level uh, with those window and metal panel installation. Finishing up the site work, new sidewalks, and you know the accessible ramps and all that. Uh, and then eventually our street trees turn green again. <laughs> uh, we have our completed building. All right, so that is the presentation, but I'm happy to take any questions. We have a, a rather shy bunch, but we do have a few questions coming in. And um, I just wanted to thank you again, Heather. Um, not only were the graphics beautiful. The time lapse was really cool to see um, everything happen um, in, in quick mode. Um, and I think what we'll do now, um, Zoe, do you want to give some additional commentary and then we'll cut to our sponsor video? Sounds good. Yeah, totally agreed. And there were quite a number of compliments as well while you were, um, while you were presenting, Heather. So Andrew Peel says, Beautiful sweet duct layout, one of the simplest I've seen in multifamily passive house buildings. Prescott Perez Fox says, I love how extra efficient design is a quote, problem to solve. A Conrad says, absolutely stunning graphics. And uh, Tamara Melnick says, ooh, I love this time lapse, so cool. Um, so now we can pass it over to Zach for a quick sponsor break. Hi, I'd like to give a big thank you to the fine organizations that make our work at Passive House Accelerator possible. 
First, a big shout out to our stakeholder partner, NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Thank you, too, to our founding sponsors, 475 High Performance Building Supply, Baxt Ingui Architects, Glavel, Minotaur All-in-One HVAC and Dehumidification Units, Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC US, Partel, Rockwell North America, Stocorp, and Zola Windows. And thank you to our champion sponsors, Icon Windows and Doors, Intelligent Membranes, Prosico, and Source 2050. And thank you to our patron sponsors, Aero Aggregates, Brennan Brennan, Brooklyn Solar Works, Euroline Windows, Coltraco Ultrasonics Micro Air Leak Detector, Inotech Windows and Doors, Lamalux, Owens Corning, RDH Building Science, Sanderson Sustainable Design, and U.S. Engineered Wood T-Stud. Thank you, sponsors. All right, and let's kick it off um, right into Q&A here. Um, I think we have first up uh, Nilton Lin. Um, he had a quick question for you, Heather, um, whether there's a hood for the range in the kitchens. Uh, there are. It's actually a microwave hood for the range. Um, so there's a, a, a hood for the range separate from our, our kitchen exhaust. And our kitchen exhaust, you know, for the pass foul standard is six feet away from that, that range. So that there's not, um, you know, cooking oils or anything else getting back into our ERV. Moving on to, um, I do see S Broad on, and you had a few questions, so. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah, I'm a professor of sustainability and real estate development at NYU. And one of the things that the development community thinks or our students think is that there are cost barriers and particularly first cost barriers um, for most real estate developers to pursue Passive House. And I'm wondering if Heather or other folks um, who added professional services to this project can speak to how they participated in uh, dispelling or overcoming those myths and barriers. Sure, I can say what our um, our clients at Trinity talk about, which is one, they're going to own these buildings for a long time. So for them, having an efficient building where they're lowering their long term costs helps overcome those short term. Um, expenditures you know there is some additional cost to doing fast house building we have um somewhat better that windows than we otherwise would have we have some more insulation we have different mechanical equipment um i do think some of those costs are coming down and becoming more equal especially in new york city as our code minimums are rising they're getting closer to passive house anyway um, our, uh, you know, Trinity was really committed to having a high quality building. So they're like, you know, the cost of passive house compared to what are uh, you saying? Co cost of compared to a code minimum building. We don't want a code minimum building. Um, and they also, yeah, they talk about their payback period, which I think they estimate around 10 years. They're going to own this building for 30 years. So, you know, for them, it's a, it's a long-term, uh, investment in, in, having this uh, building in their portfolio. Right. And can, can I, uh, Zoe or Carl, can I ask a follow-up? Um, when we when we think about a multifamily building, we I assume, or others assume, that two-thirds or more of the energy operating expenses fall to the tenant. So how, do to what extent do you understand how the, the solution that you um, just described um, uh, really fits with the operating model of an investor? So in New York City, you're required to provide heat for your tenants um, and tenants uh, pay for their own air conditioning. So one of the things that has, has had to be overcome is, uh, that they've had to overcome is how do you break out the cooling cost when you're using like a VRF that does heating and cooling? Um, so that's like a technical thing that they've, that lots of people have been working on so that they can charge tenants for cooling. But in New York City, um, building owners, landlords have to provide heat anyway. So that's that's already part of their uh, cost. So they're able to like recoup that as their, you know, through energy savings. Yeah, Heather, a, a follow-up question on that. Um, did this project use any method of breaking apart cooling or have you um, have you done that yet? Or is that kind of, uh, 
a future thing? Um, that is a little bit outside of my area of expertise of how they're <clears throat> monitoring the usage of the equipment so that they're able to break out the cooling versus heating. It might be especially tough on heat recovery VRF, I would imagine. Um, okay, next up we have Houston Eubank. Um, Houston, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your own question? Sure. Hi. Uh, it's a fabulous presentation, a fabulous project. I think your priorities for large buildings are super on the target. That's where the future has to go. I just had a, a silly question really about the sun, sun shades. They, they look brilliant to me and they look like they're very effective. I'm just curious how you coordinate with window cleaning. Yeah, um, window cleaning is all going to be done from inside of the apartments that they're um, that the window cleaners can uh, attach <laughs> to, to the inside of the building, and um, and then um, you know just reach around and clean from the inside. So uh, that was a consideration that they really can't drop a scaffold down, or it, it'd be very challenging to drop a scaffold down uh, from the roof with the sunshades in place. Great, thanks. Awesome. Um, the next question comes from Sandra, affecting change. Sandra, are you on and want to unmute? Hey there, um, fabulous project. Uh, just looked so smooth for you. I'm just wondering what was your biggest challenge with the project? Gosh, there were lots of challenges. <laughs> um, Oh, what were some of the big challenges? I mean, one, they did this entire construction during COVID. We broke ground in January of 2020. So having to add kind of COVID protocols to everything was really challenging. But uh, in terms of the passive house design, I think, you know, finding the, the right mechanical equipment um, was often really challenging. And then um, again, dealing with that cooling load, being cooling load dominated, where was, you know, at one point in a project, in the project saying, okay, um, they have the financing available to add dishwashers to every unit. So if we add 277 dishwashers to this project, how is that affecting our cooling load? So, you know, um, really having to be very conscientious every time something might have a little bit of an impact on, on cooling was really important. Yeah, this is a, a different um, scale and beast of issues, but good issues to to have to solve. Um, I think that was one of the compliments received that, you know, you have such an efficient design um, that you have different types of obstacles. Um, I think we have next up, Bekeem. If you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hey, Beckham here. Great presentation, Heather. Um, I had a question on the impact of the solar shades and if there was an EUI study uh, done to see what was the cost benefit of the added materials. Sometimes I'll approach situations where um, we're kind of trying to figure out if the cost is worth, you know, the added energy benefit or the savings from that. I was curious if you guys had done a study to figure that out. Uh, the study that was done <laughs> came down to the building will not meet the passive house cooling load standard without the sunshades. So, um, you know, the sunshades are required to bring our cooling load down far enough to meet passive house. Um, so the the cost of that, you know, the, the cost benefit, I don't know, is, is like a little bit different in that way that they're they're just kind of a required part of the building. Which was nice because they couldn't be VE'd out. <laughs> right, right. That's the challenge, the VE part. Um, awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Beckham. Um, I think I'm pronouncing this right. Elena Gavins is up next. Yes, you did pronounce it right. Um, I so I noticed that you guys included healthcare and dental within your passive house envelope. Can you kind of speak to the challenges and lessons learned with with the inclusion of that program? Sure. Um, yeah, so we have a couple of different types of spaces. We have that, the health and dental clinic. Uh, we have a community facility uh, that's more like a, like a space for a nonprofit to, to use. Uh, and we have the, the CUNY Hostos campus. And those are all in our passive house. So I think one of the challenges for non-residential passive house is that your heating and cooling 
in a different way where, you know, for residential, uh, you're, you need the building to be temperate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, as opposed to an educational facility where, you know, there's only people or these other uses where there, you know, there's people in the building from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. five days a week. Um, so I think like finding that right balance um, was really important. Um, but there wasn't a huge differentiation between the types other than our retail space, uh, which is they're actually uh, working to get a, a grocer in that retail space. Um, and so the the mechanical needs of a grocery store are just like very challenging to make work with Passive House. Um, I hope that someone cracks that nut, but, but it was like without a tenant who would be really committed to making that work, it just did not seem um, like something that we could take on. Uh, whereas we have tenants for um, most of the other spaces during design. So they were really um, committed to and excited about being in passive house spaces. And their needs were just generally like more compatible with, um, with passive house. Great. Next up, we have Ian Small with a uh, window question. I think you kind of mainly answered it when you were talking about the shades that the um, the solar heat gain of the 0.25 I noticed on one of your um, slides there. Was that on four, the four sides of the building? And I guess you couldn't have reached the passive house levels without the solar shades and the 0.25 solar heat gain. Yeah, exactly. Um, the solar heat gain was really important. Um, we did use uh, the same solar heat gain on all sides, uh, mostly as a ease of coordination and construction, um, rather than having different windows in different places. But um, yeah, we used uh, UPVC windows with that 0.25 solar heat gain coefficient. Um, they are, because we were, this project is with Fiat, we were able to do um, double pane glazing. Uh, I know PHI used to do triple pane. So um, that actually helped in terms of our, you know, the added, ex, you know, the expense of passive house, um, but also just, you know, because we're so, again, I'm saying it again and again, the cooling load dominated, what was really important for our windows was that solar heat gain coefficient more so than having, you know, triple pane versus double pane. All right, Sean St. Amour has a question for you. Yeah, with the a really experienced consultant team and construction crew and such being such a large building, was there any problems with the air barrier? And maybe I had another question too, is how many blower door tests did you guys have to achieve the, the score? <laughs> so um, we had a great team. Uh, Mananak was our contractor. They're super experienced and they had done passive house buildings before and also, you know, large scale. They did... Um, uh, they've done other uh, large scale passive house buildings in New York City. So um, we did have one challenge that came up with our air barrier that they, um, we had a, a different Henry product, uh, I believe it was MR17 or 17MR that was specified. They were, because we had these four projects running kind of in parallel, they were, Mnodnok was also working with us on another project. They were using it there and finding they weren't getting the, the thickness they needed in two applications um, and finding that having to do a third application, the, um, it was uh, basically an issue of the, um, the time it took and the, the person power to apply a third layer of the liquid applied air barrier made that uh, that material cost more than doing the uh, Henry air block STPE, which is just like a little bit, um, I, I don't know, it's like a little bit thicker or something that they were easily able to apply in, in um, two applications and get that air barrier thickness that we needed. So they kind of had that challenge on another project with us. They brought that knowledge into our project right at the beginning of construction and said, hey, we'd like to switch out the, um, the liquid applied air bar barrier for a different product. Uh, it's a more expensive product, but it's less people hours to install. So it kind of like came out in the wash a, a bit, I guess. 
Um, and they just had more confidence that they could get it right with that. Um, that said, they did a fantastic job. Our required, um, you know, we needed to, we only actually did two lower door tests for the whole building. We did have to do a lot of uh, lower door tests for units. I think they tested something like 44 individual units uh, with lower door tests. But the whole building, they tested twice. They did a taped test and an untaped test. And our tape test, um, we had an airflow that was half of the requirement of VS. So the, we were required to have like 0 0.08 and uh, we were under 0 0.04 with our taped lower door test. And our untaped lower door, te lower door test was 0 0.055. So we just like, we're well above and beyond the required air barrier in this building. It's it's pretty amazing. Great stuff. Thanks for the insight. I was busy complimenting the nod knock on that. Um, but we have next up in the queue, uh, Cynthia. Oh, hi. How are you? <clears throat> um, I, I, I'm, I'm an infant with respect to passive house. So um, you'll have to bear with me on my question, but it seems to me that those sunshades, I, I mean, I just can't get over the fact that they'll hinder future wall maintenance um, from like roof mount swing stages and bosun's chairs. Um, is there, was there not another option that, um, I mean, it looks fantastic. The building looks fantastic, but um, I just wondered whether L-shaped or vertical shades would have allowed some uh, flexibility for fu future wall maintenance, not, not let alone window. Uh, I know you talked about the windows. But. Yeah, I mean, uh, in terms of wall maintenance, you mean like, you know, so the, the shade, sun shades are all kind of built around the metal panels. So they're able to access and take metal panels down um, from, you know, while the sun shades are still in place. Um, you know, we, we also, you know, we looked at it without the sun shades with just um, roll down shades in the apartments and that was not sufficient. There needs to be some kind of exterior shading on the building. So there's, they're shading before the, the um, solar heat actually gets to the windows. Um, yeah, I guess I'm not really sure how a vertical shake might have created better access to the wall, but um, the, those horizontal shades are really helping us in the hottest part of the year when the sun is at the highest. Um, and the way our building is, uh, shaped is so that the, you know, the south wall, the tower is kind of like almost a football. <laughs> and it's so the, um, you know, the, the corridor is running north south. And we did that for a couple of reasons. One, so that we're minimizing the shade on the park to the north, but we're also minimizing that solo, that southern facade. Um, and our, our sun shades are just running, you know, across the, the south. So um, yeah, the, the hottest part of the year when the sun's really high in the sky, that's when those solar shades are going to be most effective. And we have Sean Torbert up next with an embodied carbon question. Yeah, hi, everyone. First, let me just commend uh, Datner uh, and congratulate the whole project team on, on this project. I, what a fantastic, fantastic project and uh, how timely and needed that is. So congratulations, everyone. But my question is, um, really about embodied carbon um, and wondering if there's an opportunity, if not being done already, to uh, track or quantify the embodied, embodied carbon on uh, this project in the context of whole life carbon calculations. Yeah, um, I think that's going to have to be one of the next things uh, going forward. We unfortunately have not done that on this project, but embodied carbon is so crucial. Um, and, and I guess all I can speak to here is how we really tried to minimize the amount of materials we were using. Um, and, and I think that's where embodied carbon has a really great overlap with, you know, other projects goals, like keeping costs in line. So, you know, we took a really close, hard look at our concrete structure and minimized um, you know, that structure as much as possible so that we're using as little concrete, uh, you know, it's a concrete structure, but, you know, uh, we had um, a lot, we had shear walls that 
we had designed around a, a certain uh, MEP ductwork strategy. And when that ductwork strategy changed, we went back and looked at the concrete and said, how can we reduce these shear walls? And we were able to do that with link beams between our elevator and our stair. And it, that eliminated a huge amount of concrete from the project. So it's like this constant going back and making sure that we're not, that we're using the materials we need and not more than we need. Again, that's that's one of the reasons why I really appreciate using double paint glazing is when we don't need triple paint, you know, it really helps, you know, that's lowering our embodied carbon to, to really limit the number, the amount of materials we use. But I completely agree with you. Embodied carbon is definitely the, the, the conversation that we need to have um, now <laughs> and next. Um, and I'm hopeful that, that that kind of analysis will start being a regular part of our, our projects. Um, we have a couple more minutes for questions um, before a couple other business items. Um, Rob Hoskin has a couple questions. Um, maybe you can ask one for now and then we'll put you back into the queue if we have time later. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, let's see, which one do I wanna ask? Um, <clears throat> Well, first of all, uh, amazing project. And uh, not only is it great performing, but it looks good. And so my question is kind of around, around appearance, um, you know, using sunshades. Architects love sunshades. Um, and I'm an architect. Um, and we heard, we heard about a couple of factors about like um, how many were installed and, and um, things like that. Uh, there's cost and there's the uh, there's the passive house um, meeting the energy requirements and um, I'm wondering about like how you decided where to put them because they're not on every floor um, and and what were the factors in that sure I mean some of it's just architecture <laughs> trying to make some variation we have this a uh, 26 story building um, and it's the tallest building in the neighborhood. There was a lot of concerns in the neighborhood about building such a tall building. Um, it's a really unique place. The Grand Concourse was this um, really uh, idealistic um, grand drive that, you know, when it was originally constructed, brought people from Manhattan out to the countryside of the Bronx. Um, so, you know, there's this, this big history of the Grand Concourse, and we're right at the, the beginning of that um, Grand Boulevard. So, you know, for us, we really tried to make the argument that this is, um, you know, this is the, the, the gateway to that neighborhood, and you're going to see it from all over. You do see it from all over as you're driving up from Manhattan. Um, so some of it is just aesthetic, right? We wanted to Take this tower, make it a really beautiful form, make it interesting, not just do like same, same everywhere, um, but kind of break down the, have this large tower, but still break down the scale. Um, so it feels really still like an approachable building that's, um, you know, really part of the fabric of the neighborhood. So we didn't put sunshades everywhere. We do have two different sizes of sunshades. We have like, it's a little hard to tell, but there's there's a larger sunshade. And then when there's a sunshade on, you know, three floors in a row, there, there are smaller sunshades below it. So we did try to look at, um, you know, how to be effective um, in using those sunshades to, when there's a big sunshade, it's trying, it's, you know, shading a couple of floors. And when there's a smaller sunshade, it's, it's shading one floor. Um, so we did try to look at that. But there are some floors that don't have the sunshade. So, you know, it's always balancing that like architectural statement and the, you know, again, the, the amount of materials we use and the cost of everything and the, you know, bringing all those things together to try to come up with something that is effective and, you know, looks good uh, and, and is, an, again, an efficient building. Perfect. All right. Um, we have one more question um, before a couple of notes on upcoming events. Uh, Michael Dudek. Hi, um, I'm a real estate developer and an architect. I love the sun shades and your building is significant. It's a, it's a great asset to the neighborhood. I, I couldn't say kudos to you anymore because um, I'm a commercial developer and we are trying to do a net zero building in, a, in an existing building um, of scale and it's near impossible to pull this off. Uh, so you did a great job. Um, I saw that scaffolding going around the building and, you know, I'm looking at value to the building and 
you know, all the labor just to get scaffolding up and down, it's got to be significantly expensive in, in a union city like New York. Um, did you think about using swing stages? Uh, <laughs> that's really more of a question for the contractor. Um, there are kind of means and methods. Means and uh, methods, they, yes. They looked at a couple of different uh, ways to put this building together. And actually, we looked at, you know, prefabricated uh, facade panels. Um, you know, they, they looked at a lot of different things. But, uh, you know, in the end, they felt that this was the most uh, efficient part of it. They'd come down to uh, scheduling and being able to get materials on site and in place and installed as quickly as possible um, and minimizing wait times for equipment. So I know like it was really challenging to get cranes on site. There's a real backlog or at the time there was a real backlog of being able to, to even get a large crane. Um, so they didn't want to be beholden to a, a construction method that required some piece of equipment that they would might not have access to. So in some ways it, it was like, okay, getting a bunch of little parts that you could kind of get any group of, of workers to put together um, and put up. It's kind of like, you know, going with a simpler solution um, rather than, yeah, relying on some than a, a high tech solution or a, a really specialized solution, I think was their their calculus on how to make that all work. But okay. that's definitely a Mananda question. <laughs> yeah, sorry, it just it, it's a great building. You did a great job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I want to ask a question that we are asking of all of our next gen presenters. And um, Heather, this is your time to to um, give us a peek into the future of what you think is next for the future of Passive House. Sure. Um, well, I just want to say thank you again um, for the opportunity to talk about this project. It's very near and dear to my heart, and um, for everyone attending and and um, you know the interest in Passive House, I do think Passive House is the future of of um, of architecture. You know, we really need to be uh, hitting these goals much more quickly. Um, and I think you know, as we already talked about, embodied carbon is going to be a really important next part of this conversation. Um, but the other thing that I think is really important to talk about, as much as as an architect, I love working on new construction, um, is passive house retrofit. Uh, you know, we've been saying for years, if not a decade, <laughs> that, you know, whatever, 80% of the buildings that are going to exist in 2050 exist now. Um, and so, you know, retrofitting existing buildings to meet passive house standards, I think is going to be hugely important to meeting our, our energy and climate goals. Um, and I think you know, doing so Pascal's retrofit and also figuring out how to retrofit historic structures, I think is going to be a real challenge in a lot of cities um, where obviously we have beautiful building stock, but it needs to be uh, energy efficient. Um, and, and how are we going to kind of solve those challenges, I think is the next big uh, question mark. I think we know how to do a passive house uh, retrofit, and I think there are still challenges with doing a passive house retrofit on a historic building. So um, those are the things that I, I'm hoping to see uh, become more prominent in the next next few years with Passive House. Right on. Well, so our said... future is cleaning up our past. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Heather, are you available to stay a little bit past the hour for additional questions? If not, no yeah. pressure, but there are questions keep streaming in. Sure, I can stay till 1.15. Let's go to maybe a couple more questions here. S. Broad again. Thank you. I think it was the question about the superior R value of the building envelope, the cost of that premium and the extent to which you were able to offset that cost by reducing the size of the mechanical equipment. Can you speak to that at all? Is it, was, that a, was that a potential opportunity in this project? I'm not, the cost analysis, I think was not that detailed and broken down that way. It was, you know, we were having to design to, there was a commitment to, to reach the FIA standard. So then it was, you know, doing what we need to do um, at each step of the way to make sure that we were hitting the standard. Um, and of course, always trying to keep those costs in line um, and understanding them. But I don't think there was the, that level of detail of, okay, if we're adding to this, are we taking away from this? 
the mechanical equipment on this building versus a standard building is kind of a different beast, you know, with um, the, you know, the heating and cooling is less, but we also introduced this whole ERV system. Um, so there, <clears throat> I think there's not as much MEP cost savings as, as you might hope there would be. Um, and, and yeah, there's, there is a little bit more insulation, but I think, um, yeah, I, that's just kind of where, where it is right now. It sounds like ultimately the cooling load dominated the sizing of the equipment regardless, right? Right. Um, I think we had one more question that's pretty straightforward. And this was just Sean asking if you missed something. Is this an all electric building? What, what's the hot water situation? Uh, yeah, that was an issue. It is not an all electric building. We have the gas generator. Um, the hot water at the time that we were designing, there was not um, an electric hot water solution um, that would be that would that was big enough and robust enough for to a, a three hundred thousand square foot building. Um, so this does have gas uh, for hot water heating. The buildings that we're working on now, even our non passive off buildings, we have several buildings that have gone for just full electrification. You know, there have been gas moratoriums in New York. Developers are like no longer wanting to rely on um, gas companies. So we have some buildings going for electrification for other reasons, uh, which is actually great. Um, and those those hot water heaters now, you know, that's a place where the market has totally responded to, to this need. Uh, and now there are available hot water heaters that are electric for kind of all scales of building. So um, unfortunately, that just wasn't available, uh, you know, in 20. 17, 2018, when that, those systems were being specified, but now in 2022, 20, 23, um, that's something that we are doing in, in buildings we're designing now. Great, Great. thanks. Yeah, the, the question kind of came up just with Sean's comment about embodied carbon, and I know we've talked about the grid and, and you know, if it's clean or dirty, and again, if we switch to all electric, if the grid is still dirty, you know, it, it ends up being quite a, an interesting discussion, so, but the yeah. fact that I guess New York is moving to be more green, that this all electric push um, does matter. And again, you guys are on top of it. So thanks for the insight. I mean, it's really challenging. New York state does great as a, a clean grid as a state because we have so much hydroelectric. Unfortunately, New York city is a, in itself a pretty dirty grid. We have a lot of peaker plants um, and uh, we've gotten rid of a lot of nuclear, which people feel different, all different ways about, but has you know led to more um, gas fire electric plants. So. Um, our New York City grid is actually pretty dirty, and that's something that we as a, that's a societal, I don't know, a larger community as a city, we need to, you know, force that change and, and move away from that and, and towards a cleaner grid. But as architects working on an individual building, the best we can do is set up the infrastructure so that when the great grid is cleaner, that our building is able to, uh, you know, take advantage of that and and, you know, Grand Concourse doesn't have PVs, but it's PV ready. So like, as we're able to add those kind of renewable technologies on our buildings, I think electrification is a big part of that picture. Um, I would say, so everything else, like we have electric washer dryers, everything else on our building is electric except the hot water heater and the generators. All right. Thanks, Sean, both Sean's for prompting that. Um, we are about at time here. Heather, thank you so much for your time, for going over time. Thank you so much for um, just showing us all about this project um, and the work that you do. Thanks, everyone, so much for joining. Thank you.